Okay. So I'm glad you all are engaged. Some, some of you are asking advanced questions. We may not be able to answer all of them in this course. Uh, but now we know the reorder buffer. Keep that in mind. Reorder buffer is good for preserving sequential semantics. That's one function. But we just saw the other function. It's actually able to rename the registers. So we're going to take, uh, take advantage of that renaming functionality. OK, so now we're starting the out-of-order execution le lecture. This is a fascinating topic. People have worked on it for a long time. The fundamental concept is developed in 1960s, actually. I'm going to give you a history of it also. So this is where we are, basically. We're done, essentially, with at least some issues in pipelining. We haven't covered. There are a lot more issues. If you take an advanced course, if you design your own pipeline, you will figure that out. Now we're going to do out-of-order execution. And then we're going to switch to other execution paradigms. OK, I've already given you this one. Uh, maybe let me, let me actually talk a little bit about this based on the questions that uh, I received very quickly. So whenever you're decoding an instruction, you do multiple things. You first access your source registers, right? You need to get your source registers. And your source register can be in the register file, based on the picture we drew, can be in the reorder buffer, or can be in the bypass paths. So let me actually switch over here again uh, very quickly. We're going to see more of this uh, soon when we talk about auto verification, but I want you to get this very clearly. So let's assume that uh, you're fetching instruction at uh, decoding instruction at R3, R4. What you need to do is first access, figure out where is R3 and R4. Now, if both of them are valid in the register file, it's easy. You get the value, right? That's it. And then you can execute. If, let's say, one of them is invalid over here, then the value might be coming from here or coming from the bypass paths, right? So how do you figure that out? So basically, let's assume R3 is invalid. Then uh, the latest instruction that wrote to R3 should have put its reorder buffer entry ID over here. So you know that R3 is going to eventually be produced by reorder buffer entry 131. During that decode stage, you check whether that R3 is already there. Now, if this is one, meaning R3 is valid, already produced by this entry 131, you can get the value from here. Make sense? Now, there may be the case this is also zero meaning that R3 is going to be produced by 131, but it's not produced yet. Then the instruction that's going to produce it is still executing in the pipeline. There's a pipeline somewhere over here. And you need to wait for it. What does that mean? If you don't have the bypass paths, you stall. If you do have the bypass paths, then you need to be able to schedule the instruction such that it gets the value from the bypass paths. And we saw bypassing forwarding last time, so you should construct that picture. OK? So now we're going to make use of these concepts to build out-of-order execution. OK, let me switch back to this. Hopefully it did switch. That's good. So we've already built this pipeline. I'm not going to go over this in detail. We just covered this, actually. And always recall this data dependence types. We've now eliminated the anti and output dependencies. Now we're making the system look more like data flow, actually, at least in the underneath. Because in data flow, what really matters is this, right? Remember, data flow, there's no registers in data flow, if you think about when we discuss data flow. It's all about data flow. You produce some data, and there's a consumer of data. This is the only true case. Here, there is no producer-consumer relationship between the instructions. It's just dependence on a name, right? This instruction doesn't consume what this is producing, nor the other way around. They're just connected to each other because they happen to reference the same register. But the value in the register is completely different. It's just a name. As a result, we can eliminate this easily. And what we did with the reorder, uh, reorder buffer is eliminating that, renaming. And that's true for this also. There's no data flow relationship between these two instructions. This R3 is actually referring to completely different things. Okay, so that's why we eliminated, and I've already talked about this. Essentially, what we've done is we mapped the register ID to a reorder buffer entry ID. 
or you can think of this as architectural register ID is mapped to a physical register ID. Uh, and after renaming, reorder of entry ID is used to refer to the register. That's going to be the name of the register. Okay, so now we're going to build uh, out of order execution. So we're still in order in the sense that uh, we're not able to, if there's a true data dependency over here, we're not going to dispatch this instruction. Dispatch means it's the act of sending an instruction to a functional unit. It needs to wait. Okay, but renaming with reorder buffer LMA stalls you to false dependencies. So if you have false dependencies, you can still keep going. But the problem is that a true depend data dependency stalls the dispatch of younger instructions. So if you have an instruction over here that's waiting for register three, and register three is not available yet, and you cannot get it from the bypass paths, because the bypass, you still need to wait to be able to bypass, you just wait. Meaning that you just stole the pipeline. But what if there were some other instructions and in later in the program execution order that didn't need that value, or that didn't need any value that's produced by any instruction in the pipeline? That could have gone. Well, too bad. We've stalled the pipeline. They cannot even get into the pipeline, right? So out of order execution is going to solve that problem. So the key question is, can we do better? So we're going to look at two pieces of the program. Uh, initially, ignore this question over here. But basically, if you have this quote, this add is dependent on this multiply clearly. Multiply produces R3, the add consumes R3. But these younger instructions are completely independent of both of these instructions. So if you have an in-order pipeline, what happens is this add waits for eight cycles until the multiply produces R3. And these poor guys also wait, even though they didn't have to because they could have gone, right? So a good compiler, what a good compiler would do is recognize this, that these are independent and reorder them before the add so that they could execute. That's one way of solving the problem, right? But if, if, if this is the code that you have and the machine's executing it, this ad needs to stall. And all of the other instructions cannot go into the pipeline. Similarly, that's true for the load. I just changed this to a load over here. Uh, and if the load is producing R3, this ad stalls. Now the difference is this load can take thousands of cycles, right? So it's difficult for a compiler actually to reorder the code over here. It could reorder, but how are you going to fill thousands of cycles with that if you, want, if you don't want to stall? So, okay, basically the first add stalls the pipeline. These two pieces of the code, that's what they have in common. An add cannot dispatch because it's source registers. I shouldn't say registers. It's just one register over here because we don't know what R1 is. R1 is assumed to be available, uh, is unavailable. As a result, these later independent instructions, the blue ones, cannot get executed uh, and you lose performance. So, okay, how are the above code portions different? Load latency is variable. I've already given you that. So multiply latency is usually not variable, but it could also be variable. You know, it depends on the value that you have. If one of the operands is zero, you may have a shortcut in hardware that says that directly you do zero, right? You have a zero checker. As opposed to doing the multiply cycle by cycle, you just check if any of the operands is zero and you return a zero. So that could also be variable. And if you want to do the code reordering at compile time, uh, you may not uh, always know the latency. So multi even multiply latency could be variable, but load latency is a lot more variable because you may hit in the cache, it could be three cycles, one cycle. You may hit in the next level cache, it could be 40 cycles. You may hit in the next level cache, it may be 80 cycles. And you may miss all levels of cache and have to go to memory. It could be 650 cycles in Xbox 360, if you remember. Okay, so this part is actually, loads are a lot difficult to handle for the compiler. So that's why this point over here. If the compiler is able to reorder the code such that it can eliminate the stalls, that's good. You've seen this in the la last lectures, but it's not always able to do this. Uh, one of the reasons is you don't, it doesn't know the latency of the instructions. And the other reason I will put over here is what if there was a branch somewhere over here? If there's a branch, if and else, how can you reorder an instruction? This is actually a dilemma that compilers make because you don't know if the instruction is going to be executed or not. Right? You cannot take this instruction, move it up, because it's under a branch. Okay, think about that. We're not going to go into this, and we're not going to really go into this in this course. But if you take a compiler's course, that's what the compilers do. Figure out how to reorder the code in the presence of all of these difficult issues, like branches, long, long latency. But it's not easy. In the end, it's not very easy. 
they actually jump through a lot of hoops that's employed in all compilers that are out there, uh, but they still cannot achieve the performance of what I'm going to describe uh, next, which is the out-of-order execution. Okay, so the problem that we're going to solve is in-order dispatch, in-order scheduling, or in-order execution, it's called. I like in-order dispatch, because you're really dispatching an instruction to an execution unit. So a solution is really out-of-order dispatch. <laughs> Basically, we want to do out-of-order scheduling. Whenever we get an instruction, whenever we are decoding it, we want to be able to say, okay, you can go out of order because you have all of your values. And then we're going to fix the problem later on with the reorder buffer. So we don't need to worry about fixing the reordering. We've already solved it. And we've seen the basic idea of out of order dispatch before. This is really about data flow. And we're going to use the same principles. We're going to build a mini data flow engine uh, in hardware inside the processor. So data flow says you fire an instruction only when its inputs are ready. And that's what exactly we're going to do. We're going to keep track of the readiness of the source operands of each instruction. And if they're both ready, then the instruction is going to execute and produce a result. And that result will be sent to all of those instructions that are waiting for that result. And all of those instructions will capture that result and will become ready if both of their source operands are ready. And then instructions will execute, and then they will produce a result, and then they will fire, basically. So instructions will be firing their results, and instructions that are waiting for those results will be matching uh, those results. So we will see, we'll look at the machinery of this. So we will use basically very similar principles, but not exposed in the ISA. We're going to do everything in a von Neumann architecture. Von Neumann architecture says everything needs to be executed sequentially. We're going to break that completely. We're going to execute everything in data flow order. And then we're going to clean up this mess with the reorder buffer that we've discussed. Okay, so just quickly before we go into it, there are other ways to prevent dispatch stalls. I've already given you actually the compile time instruction scheduling and reordering. If you can do it at the compile time, that's good, but there are a lot of limitations related to this. Uh, and people have tried a lot actually to make compile time reordering match the performance of auto order execution. It's not easy. Usually compile time reordering actually helps a machine but it's very difficult to match a very good out-of-order execution machine. And you've seen other examples. So whenever you have a, an instruction, you don't know the value. Let's say it's sourcing register three, you predict the value. Maybe the R3 is zero, right? I'm not gonna go into this. This is actually employed in very limited ways in existing processors, but it's, it's caused a mess in the sense that what, is your, what if your prediction was wrong? Okay. That's where we, we will leave it for now. But we, we've seen something else, which is fine-grained multi-threading, which is do something else, right? So the, uh, if you remember, fine-grained multi-threading is every cycle you fetch from dif a different program, a different thread. Assuming there are no data dependencies between those different programs, you have no problem. You never stall for dispatch. Because by definition, you've eliminated the data dependencies, true dependencies, right? Whenever an instruction gets to the dispatch stage, the next instruction is completely independent because it's from a different thread. So that's another solution to the problem. And you've also seen the downside of the solution. If you don't have enough threads, there's a problem. If you have only one thread, and if, if, if the performance of a thread matters to you, this is actually very bad for the performance of that thread because you have this pipeline, but you're really not utilizing it for that particular thread. Every cycle you're fetching from a different thread, and if you want to get rid of the data dependencies, you need to ensure that there are no instructions from that thread that are dependent on each other. So you fetch from a thread every n cycles. If you remember Frank's lecture, uh, you fetch uh, every eight cycles, for example, uh, from a thread. That's not good. The performance of that latency critical thread didn't improve. It may be very useful for throughput, like GPUs use fine-grained multi-threading, if you remember again. And there you have lots of independent threads, and what you care about is throughput, so you can do this. But if what you care about is latency, when I press this button, I want to get this working, that's a latency-bound program. If a single thread is handling that, fine-grained multi-threading doesn't help you, because you really need to execute the sequence of instructions that need to start when you actually press this. And that latency is important, because otherwise I'll, I'll not be happy, because this will take minutes to respond, right? Okay, 
So there are other ways of solving the problem, but not of, not all, uh, they all have different trade-offs, as you can see. And computer architecture is all about trade-offs, if you remember. It's the soul of architecture. OK, so, so we're going to look at out-of-order execution. It's also called dynamic scheduling, not static scheduling. Static schedule is static. It doesn't change. Dynamic scheduling is dynamic. It changes based on the availability of data in this case. So the, the key idea is, what is the key problem? We have this instruction that cannot move because it's dependent on something else that's not ready yet, some other instruction. So what do we do? Well, move that instruction out of the way so that in independent instructions can go into the pipeline. It's a very simple idea. If you're, how many of you drive cars? OK. If there, is, if there is a car in front of you that's slow, what do you do? You take that car and move it out of the way, right? <laughs> so that's one solution. That's what we're going to do. So basically, <laughs> you pass the car. That's another solution. If you have space to pass that car, you can do it. Or the car basically says, OK, I'm moving too slowly, so I'm going to move to the next lane over here. Or I have to stop for some reason. I need to wait, so I get out of the highway, right? I get out of the road. That's the idea. So basically, we're going to introduce a place to keep these instructions. We're going to call them reservation stations. For whatever historical reason, people call them reservation stations. You can think of these as rest areas for cars if you're going through the highway and for some reason you're dependent on something. You basically go out of the highway so that other cars can go. It would be terrible if every car that's dependent on something had to wait in, front, in the highway, right? Makes no sense. Exactly, the pipeline doesn't make no sense. Uh, doesn't make any sense if you're waiting for a dependency and no other instruction can go. So that's the first thing. While the instructions are sitting there in these rest areas or reservation stations, we're going to monitor the source values. Basically check if the source values are ready for this instruction. If they're ready, then we can actually fire this instruction. When all of the source values of an instruction are available or ready, are produced, then we fire or dispatch the instruction. So that's the dispatch. That's out-of-order dispatch. You basically dispatch an instruction when its source values are ready, and that's exactly the soul of data flow. So instructions are now dispatched in data flow order, not control flow order. Instructions are put into the reservation stations in control flow order, but the execution dispatch into the execution units happens in the data flow order. And the key benefit is now independent instructions can execute and complete in the presence of a long latency operation. If you have a long latency multiply and then an instruction that's dependent on it, you don't wait for that. Other instructions that are independent can go and execute and even finish. So you don't need to stall the pipeline for these long latency operations. OK, so this is a simple example, uh, a high level first, and then we're going to go into the machinery of this. So this is a machine with in-order dispatch and precise exceptions, and this is the code uh, that we're executing. If you look at the second instruction, it's dependent on this multiply, so it needs to stall. As a result, the blue instructions that are independent of either of these also stall. And then this red one also stalls because there is a true data dependency over here. So if you do the calculations, you get 16 cycles over here. Sounds not too bad. If you do out-of-order dispatch and also have precise exceptions in the end, basically write the results in, into the reorder buffer, in, uh, write the results into the register file in program order, this is what you do. The second instruction in the decode stage doesn't stall. It basically goes into these reservation stations and waits. Now you can fetch the next instruction. It also goes into reservation station. It becomes available right away, and it executes. The next instruction after that can also execute. We've, we're filling the pipeline nicely right now because we've moved this dependent instruction out of the way into the reservation stations. And again, if you do the calculations, you get 12 cycles as opposed to 16 cycles. That's a significant benefit. You've improved performance by 25%. But this will come at a cost. OK. And of course, this is just a toy example, right? If you actually look at a lot of dependencies and very long latency instructions, the benefit of out of order execution has been shown to be very high compared to in order execution. OK, so what do we need to do to enable this? Uh, first of all, we need to link the consumer of a value to a producer. An instruction that needs a value should be linked to the producer of that value. We know how to do this with registry renaming so that we can track 
uh, when, when the producer produces the value and the consuming instruction needs to fire. So you need to buffer the instructions until they're ready to execute, take them out of the way of independent instructions. Instructions need to keep track of the readiness of their source values because we, the instruction is going to go into the functional unit after both source values are ready. And when all source values of an instruction are ready, you need to dispatch the instruction to the functional unit. So we're going to go through an example of this, but this is, these are really the four things that you need to enable out-of-order execution. So how do you link the consumer of a value to a producer? That's register renaming. If you remember this register file, I have valid value and the reorder buffer entry. Let me call that reorder buffer entry a tag. We rename a register to a tag, and the tag identifies the instruction that's going to produce the value. Okay? So we rename the register, and we're going to use that tag to identify the instruction that's going to produce that value. Uh, how do you buffer the instructions? You insert the instruction to reservation stations after renaming. We'll see that. How do you keep track of the readiness of the source values? Basically, when an instruction finishes execution, you know that instruction, you've tagged it. If it's going to produce R3, it is a tag. Reorder buffer entry, let's say. We're going to show that that tag could be anything, actually. Uh, you, you broadcast the value, basically send it to everywhere in the machine, and you also broadcast a tag, meaning send that tag to everywhere. And instructions that are waiting for that tag compare the tag that they're waiting for to the tag that's broadcast, that's sent. If there's a match, then they capture the value because the previous instruction that's producing the value broadcast it, and they... Li they're linked to each other with this tag. So we will see this. Uh, it'll become a lot more clear when we actually go through the uh, animations. But that's how we link the instructions. And when an instruction finishes, produce the value, that's how you communicate the value to a dependent instruction because the producer instruction has a tag, saying A, for example, and the consumer instruction is waiting for that tag, and there's a matching that happens. Yes? Let's, let's ignore that for now. <laughs> if, you, if you get full, you stall, basically. <laughs> we're we're going to assume that it's not full. But whenever, you get, whenever some structure gets full, you stall. <laughs> yes? Uh, what's the point of even broadcasting the value itself when uh, the value could actually just be read from the register? Absolutely, yes. That's a very good point. But uh, you, you could optimize it. Okay. Okay. So when all of the sources, source registers, or source tags of an instruction, source values of an instruction are ready, now you can dispatch the instruction to its functional unit. You can call it as instruction waking up. Instruction is sleeping in the reorder buffer because some of the values are not ready. It's monitoring the source values. When a source value gets produced because somebody broadcast a tag, the instruction wakes up because all source values, when, when it, all of the source values are produced, and then it gets, it gets fired into the execution unit. Of course, if there are multiple instructions that are awake, you need to select one per functional unit. Okay, so that's the idea, basically. It's very simple, right? Now we're gonna complicate the machine a lot more. So this, uh, very quickly, a little bit of history. This was invented in 1967 in IBM 36091. Uh, this is not the first out of order execution algorithm, but it's perhaps a more elegant one. The older out-of-order execution algorithm was actually by Control Data Corporation in the 1960s. It was a different algorithm. Uh, but if you're really interested, you can read this paper. So the major difference today, at that time, for, for some time, for about 20 years or so, this was a good algorithm, but it was very difficult to uh, employ it in practice because people didn't incorporate precise exceptions onto it. So things were getting out of order, and it was difficult to debug. Now, once you add precise exceptions to it, which these paper actually, papers actually did, these papers heavily influenced Pen Intel's first out-of-order engine, Intel Pentium Pro. Uh, if you actually read the book Pentium Chronicles, uh, it's a beautiful book that I would recommend. It's about business, it's about technical, how do you, how do you actually design an uh, out-of-order machine? It talks about that by Bob Colwell, who was the chief architect of Intel Pentium Pro. You will see the history of it. Uh, essentially, the reason out of order execution became uh, everywhere is because of what we just discussed earlier, a reorder buffer, or a mechanism to ensure that instructions are reordered at the end to the sequential uh, processing. 
And basically, it's used in all high-performance processors. So this is the pipeline that we're going to build. And I call this a pipeline with two humps, if you will. Uh, so you have an in-order engine. Uh, you uh, decode the instructions in order, rename them, and put them into reservation stations. And instructions basically wake up over here. They get scheduled into the execution units. And whenever an instruction finishes, it broadcasts its tag and value to wake up instructions that are waiting for it. And instruction also goes into the reorder buffer at the end. And then an instruction finishes, updates the architectural register file uh, after that reorder buffer, whenever it becomes the oldest. So this part we've already covered. This part we've already covered. Now we're going to look at this part. So this part of the pipeline is really completely out of order now, the scheduling. So the first one is reservation stations. It's also called the scheduling window. And the second one is reordering. So you have a reorder buffer uh, instruction window or active window. Maybe this is a good analogy of a uh, pipeline with two humps, right? It's not an exact analogy, but basically instructions come here, and then they get reordered in the middle, and then they go out. OK, that's a joke. <laughs> but essentially, you have these two, uh, two big things uh, that, are, uh, that are reordering the flow. Here it's in order. Here it's out of order. Here it's in order back again. OK. And this is from the uh, paper that you're supposed to read which is really still uh, one of the state-of-the-art surveys of how existing out-of-order execution machines behave. So we're going to see this. I'm going to skip this. You can, you, you can read this. And this is from 1965 when uh, Thomas Sulo designed his machine, uh, the first out-of-order machine. OK, so recall the register renaming. So we're going to rename things. So we're going to use the register file that we developed, actually. Uh, this is also called the register rename table now. Uh, register alias table, except things are a little bit in different order over here. We're going to fix that in a little bit. Basically, a register can be valid. Uh, if it's valid, you get the value out of the register alias table or register file. If it's invalid, it's going to be produced by the instruction that has a tag. And that tag is some other namespace, basically. Remember, we associate that tag to a reorder buffer entry, but it could really be anything. As long as you identify the instruction, it, it, it uniquely identifies the instruction that's going to produce that version of, our, uh, of that register. So it just needs to be a unique name. OK. So very quickly, Thomas Sowell's algorithm. Uh, so basically, whenever we are decoding an instruction, we check if there's a reservation station available before renaming. If there is no reservation station available to put this instruction, we stall. That answers your question. So whenever you run out of entries to put the instructions, you need to stall. Uh, and instruction and renamed operands are inserted into the reservation station if one is available, and you only rename if reservation station available. While in the reservation station, each instruction watches the common data bus to capture the tag. And when the tag is seen, you grab the value for the source and keep it in the reservation station. When both operands are available, instruction is ready to be dispatched. And when the instruction is ready, you dispatch it to the functional unit. And after the instruction finishes in the functional unit, you basically broadcast the tag, uh, tag and the value. And register file is also connected. Register alias table is also connected to this uh, common data bus. And we have already discussed the register file. OK, so now let's, let's go through an example of how this works. We're going to execute this program, basically. Uh, this is fetch, decode, execute, write back. We are going to assume add is four cycles, multiply is six cycles. We're going to assume one adder and one multiplier. So there are questions. These are actually good exam questions also. How many cycles does it take to execute this program in a non-pipeline machine, an in-order dispatch pipeline machine with imprecise exceptions, no forwarding and full forwarding? There are two examples of it. And in, in order dispatch pipeline machine, an out-of-order dispatch pipeline machine with imprecise exceptions. So ignore the reorder buffer for now. So this is the same question. And I'm not going to do the first part. This is the execution timeline with scoreboarding. It looks terrible. It takes about 31 cycles. This is the execution timeline with data forwarding. You can reduce the execution time to 25 cycles. OK, you can do this on your own. We've already done it. And if you actually have Tomoslo's algorithm, which is out of order execution, you actually reduce it to 20 cycles. So your 25 cycles become 20 cycles. Now let's take a look at how we make it 20 cycles. So in the past, I used to draw this by hand, but one of your colleagues who took this course about two years ago uh, was nice enough to actually provide animations. 
for what I used to draw by hand. So we're going to use the animations uh, now. So let's, and this is the animation beginning. OK. So this is a program we're going to simulate. It's the same program that I showed you, multiplies and adds. This is the initial value of the register alias table. So you have all registers that are valid, and these are the values. So tags don't matter, because everything is valid. And this is the reservation station for the add unit, and this is the reservation station for the multiply unit. And each uh, unit has an adder and a multiplier, and whenever an instruction finishes, it produces a tag, and it produces a value that gets broadcast everywhere. And let's simulate this program first. Before that, we've already said add and multiply execution units have separate buses, so they can actually finish at the same time. Uh, and initially, reservation stations are all invalid, empty. I'm not showing those invalid bits over here, but there needs to be some mechanism that allocates these reservation stations. And all registers are valid, because that's the beginning of the program. OK, let's well, start with cycle 0. This is cycle 0. Nothing has happened yet. That's easy. Cycle 1, we fetch the first instruction. Nothing really interesting happens, because something interesting happens when we decode that instruction, right? So let's take a look at how we decode that instruction. So basically, this is the decode of the multiply instruction. What do we do? First thing is, it needs to be allocated a reservation station entry. Is there a reservation station entry available? And the answer is yes. This is a multiply, so it needs to be allocated somewhere over here. So we're going to allocate it to reservation station X over here on top. Now, what does that mean? We basically check if there is a, we already did this. Second step, we need to read the source values and tags from the register alias table. So we basically take register one, index register alias table, get these. So it's valid. As a result, it's values one. Tag, we don't care. So we're going to put that into the reservation station. The second source is R2. Again, we read it and put it over here. Now, if you see, both of these are valid. So this instruction should be able to execute in the next cycle. And you have, you have the values also in the reservation stations, right? Now we need to do some important step. Now what's happening is this instruction is writing to register 3. Register 3 is going to be produced by a reservation station tag x. So we need to rename the register so that later instructions that need that register 3 can refer to x. So what does that mean? The register is now invalid because the value in the register file is not up to date anymore but the value is going to come from tag x, meaning that the instruction that was just allocated to uh, reservation station x is going to produce that value. So that's our tag. Later instructions are going to get that tag if they need, R, uh, if they source R3. Okay, so now R3 is renamed to x, as you can see over here. Its new value will be produced by the reservation station that's identified with tag x. And as you can see, these are all happening concurrently, by the way. Uh, multiplying RSX is ready to execute in the next cycle. Of course, you need to rename, uh, you need to get the source operand before you rename. So if you're writing to the same register as you're reading, you need to first get the old value and then you update the name, right? Okay, so in the next cycle, multiply in, in this reservation station entry is ready to execute. Let's take a look at the next cycle then. So there are two things that are happening. Multiply in RS starts executing because there's some logic that checks if both of the sources are valid. If both of them are valid, that's great. We can send it to the execution unit. How do you do that? You check the readiness of both sources. Then the instruction wakes up. There's logic that does that. You can do it in the previous cycle a little bit also. But we're not going to talk about timing for now. Uh, and then the, instructions, uh, the instruction gets sent uh, to the multiplier with its source values and the tag. So X, you need to, because eventually you need to send the broad, broadcast, the tag, and the value. And it will take six cycles. So we can forget about it for now. We also decode the next instruction. Let's take a look at how the next instruction gets decoded. This is an add that's writing to R5. It's reading from R3 and R4. Remember, we're going to go through the same steps. First, we need to allocate a reservation station entry. Is one available? This is an add. Yes, it's available. So we're going to allocate reservation station entry A for this. The next step. We're going to rename the source uh, uh, register. Uh, no, we're going to read the source registers from the register file. One source register is R3. R3 has, is not valid. The tag is X. Value, we don't care, because value is not trustworthy over here. It's going to be produced by X. 
So we're going to read that entry directly into the reservation station so that we can monitor this tag. The next one is R4. Uh, the next source register is R4. So R4, oh, sorry. There you go. Okay. So, okay, this is it. Basically, R4 is valid. Uh, as a result, its value is also stored over here. Tag, we don't care. Now we need to rename the destination register. That's the next step. Destination register is R5. R5 gets renamed to the reservation station entry that we just allocated this instruction that's going to produce R5. So R5, the alt bit becomes zero, and the tag becomes A. Sounds great. All right. Now add in RS, reservation station A cannot execute in the next cycle because one source is not valid. It's just going to wait there. But the beautiful thing is, in the next cycle, add in RS A waits because its one source is not valid. But we can now decode the next instruction that's independent. It turns out we will see that it's independent, uh, which we couldn't do in an in-order machine. Okay, let's take a look at what we do. We basically do exactly the same thing we did in the previous cycle for decoding. Now you know what to do. We, read the, we first figure out whether we can allocate a reservation station entry for the ads. The answer is yes. Well, we allocate reservation station B to it because A is already occupied. Then we read the source operands. What does that mean? We read R2 and R6. Now if you go read R2, you will find that it's valid. Its value is two, great. If you read R6, you will also find that it's valid and it's value 6. So in the next cycle, this should be able to execute. And we also rename uh, the destination register R7 to the reservation station entry ID that we put this uh, instruction into. So R7 gets renamed to B. It's going to be produced by uh, the instruction that we just put into B from now on. Okay. Now we placed an independent instruction into the pipeline without stalling for the previous instruction that had a true dependency. And this new instruction that we placed is ready to execute in the next cycle. And at the, in the same cycle, we're also fetching the next, next instruction clearly, right? This is a pipeline. Okay, let's take a look at the next cycle. So basically, this instruction will be executed out of order in the next cycle. Next cycle, this multiply is still executing. This add is still waiting in A over here. Now this add can start executing because its source values are both valid. And that's the part of out-of-order execution. Essentially, we've enabled the execution of this instruction without stalling the pipeline for this instruction that was dependent. And this instruction starts executing out of program order. It's going to take four cycles, and you supply the tag and the source values, and it's going to produce the addition of the source values, and it's going, when it's done, it's going to broadcast the tag and the value. Okay, now we're going to decode the next instruction in this cycle, and it's the same drill, basically. It's going to get boring. So I'm going to go through it very quickly. Basically, you need to read, uh, first of all, you need to ensure that you can allocate a reservation station entry for this ad. We allocate reservation station C. We read the source operand one, source operand two. They both happen to be valid. So this instruction is also going to be able to execute in the next cycle. That's good. And then we rename R10 to the reservation station in which we allocated this add into. So R10 becomes named to C. Okay. In the next cycle, this is still executing. This, uh, the, second ad, uh, the first add is still waiting. The second add is still executing. Now this instruction we previously placed into the reservation station can also execute. That's also going to execute out of order. That's good. The next instruction is going to get renamed. Let's take a look at this a little bit. It's, it needs R7 and R10, it's a multiply. The first step is, is there a reservation station entry available? It is available, that's great. We're gonna read the sources, R7 and R10. They're both not ready, as you can see over here. So we're gonna put them into the source one and source two. So this instruction clearly is not going to execute in the next cycle. Uh, so, but it's going to wait for the values that are produced by tag B and tag C, meaning that instructions that are in reservation station B and reservation station C. So by just looking at this picture, you can kind of tell which instructions are dependent on each other, right? The instruction that's placed into reservation station Y is a multiply. It's waiting for its first operand to come from the instruction that's in reservation station B and the second operand to come from reservation station C. That's how we link the instructions now. You can actually reconstruct the reverse engineer the data flow graph by just looking at this picture.
And we're going to do that in the beginning of next lecture. But uh, I'll finish this example and then we'll finish this lecture. Okay, so that's good. Now let's go into a more interesting case. So this is cycle seven. This instruction cannot execute, but this instruction we decode, the last instruction, R5, R11. Basically, we allocate a reservation station entry, and this instruction also happens to have both of its sources not ready. It's waiting for uh, tag A and tag Y. Now let's take a look at what happened to R5 here. It's interesting. R5 was named to A before. It was going to be produced by this instruction that's in A, because this instruction was writing to R5. Now there's another instruction that writes to R5. It basically renames R5 to its reservation station tag D. So now every instruction that comes afterwards is going to get the correct value of R5 from this uh, tag. That's the beauty of renaming. You can link instructions appropriately. OK, at this point, all six instructions are now decoded and renamed. If you actually look at this picture, you should be able to reconstruct the data flow graph. Actually, in this case, you should be able to reconstruct the program. If I don't give you this program, for example, over here, and I give you just this, you can give me the program. OK, we'll see that. OK, we discussed what happened to R5. So cycle eight is an interesting cycle. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on this. This is the first slide, that's why. So what's happening in cycle eight? So multiply in RSX, reservation station X, is done, actually, because it's, this is the last cycle. And we're going to uh, send the value out. As we're assuming that in the, in the last cycle of execution, you can send the value out in this case uh, through bypass. So we, what we do is we broadcast multiply uh, multiplies tag. Essentially, this is what's happening. X gets broadcast everywhere to all of the locations where there's a tag. And then all of the locations have comparators. They compare the broadcast tag X to the X that they're waiting. So if you look over here, this location was waiting for X, R3. It was, it was not valid, and it was waiting for X. Hmm. This was not valid, and this was waiting for X. Recall what this is. This is uh, this instruction that is waiting for R3. This is broadcasting R3 now, at least that definition of R3. And nothing else is really waiting for X. So what happens is these locations compare the tag to the broadcast tag. If the tag matches, and if the val bit is zero, that means that they're really waiting for this value. So what they do is they capture the result which is also broadcast, and become valid. Because they were waiting for that value, and they got it. And as a result, this instruction now can execute because its source register 1 is valid, and source register 2 is valid. So it's ready to execute in the next cycle. In the next cycle, this is going to go into the uh, adder. OK, this is the first slide. So, so we broadcasted the tag, and we broadcasted the value. That's a lot of wires. Uh, let me finish this, and then we're going to uh, be done. So the second thing that's happening is exactly the same thing. It turns out this instruction add is also done, so it does exactly the same thing. It broadcasts its tag, which is B. B goes everywhere, and it broadcasts its value also. So every location that's waiting for B, uh, let me go back, that's waiting for B and that's invalid, captures the value that's broadcast, and essentially they get eight. Okay, so cycle eight was the interesting cycle. This, was, this is where we ended. This was really the interesting uh, cycle where uh, this instruction finished execution, uh, as you can see over here, and also some other instruction finished execution. Let's take a look at this instruction. So when this instruction finishes execution, after six cycles, as you can see, it broadcasts its tag, X. As you can see, this will hopefully animate. And you can see that X is being broadcast to all locations in the machine where you see tag. So all of the places where you see tag, you should send the tag, because there might be some instructions waiting for that tag. And the instructions that are waiting for that tag and that do not have it valid uh, over here capture the value. So value get also broadcast, gets also broadcast. And these capture the value such that they become valid, and the value becomes stored over here. So there are two, two things that are waiting for value uh, tag x over here, r3 in the register file, and also uh, the, the first source of 
this instruction uh, in, in reservation station A for the add reservation station. And they both capture the value because uh, the, the, the value is not valid yet. And they store two. That makes sense, right? The first instruction multiplied one by two, uh, produced the value uh, two in R3, and R3 captured it. And the instruction that's waiting for that value also captured that. Now this instruction can execute because both of the sources became valid. Okay? So now you should ask yourself, what is it, what is it required to enable this? Right? It's, it's actually a lot of circuitry, as you can see, right? We are storing all these tags, okay? But whenever we are doing a broadcast, we're sending uh, the tag of the instruction that's just finished execution everywhere in the machine where you see tag. And all of those locations have comparators comparing the tag that's stored to the tag that's broadcast, and they're checking equivalence. If those are equal, then you're, uh, you, you know that uh, the tag being broadcast is the thing that you're waiting for. And of course, uh, the instruction should also, um, the, 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 the tag you're waiting for, the value you're waiting for should not be valid as well, because you may have a stale tag over here. So basically, it's a lot of comparators. You have a lot of comparators here. You have a lot of comparators here, 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 here. So if you want to have lots of instructions, lots of reservation stations, you, the cost of this increases. And also, you need to broadcast the value, so you need to have buses. Uh, when you broadcast the value, if the tag, is e tag matches and if this is not valid, you capture the value and write the result in the appropriate location, just like we did over here. So that's also cost. Now there's also another cost, which is cycle eight. There's something else that's happening. The adder happens to finish the instructions executing also, so it broadcasts the tag of that instruction B, and you need to do the same thing. Basically, B also needs to be broadcast in the same cycle at the same time to all of the locations that are marked as tag over there. So you need to have not just one comparator. We had a comparator for the multipliers broadcast tag. You have another comparator for each location to capture the tag that's broadcast by the adder. So now you have two comparators per entry. Right? That doesn't sound very good. Yes? Yeah, exactly. This is imprecise exceptions. In this example, we don't have a reorder buffer. I'm going to introduce that later on. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, you said that uh, there's a thing that happens if you have stale data. Yeah. You mentioned that the valid bit is one, but it still has the tag from the previous. Uh, That's right, yes. When could that happen because the valid bit is one? That could happen when you, when you flush the pipeline for some reason. Okay. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't worry about that now. <laughs> It's not, yeah, but when you actually don't, uh, if, if, you don't, if you never flush the pipeline, it shouldn't happen. But if you flush the pipeline for some reason, and if you don't reset the tags, then it could happen. Okay, so now you see uh, how this works. I mean, your colleagues have very good points. We don't have a reorder buffer here, right? We are barely broadcasting, we're really updating the register file here, register alias table. So reorder buffer will change this a little bit, but not by much. Basically, we're not going to update the register file, to, uh, well, uh, okay, I'm not going to go into that right now, but let's finish this example. Okay, you saw you also broadcast add result. So that uh, the ones uh, that are waiting for the result, which were waiting for tag B, capture the value. And now some of them can start executing. Well, this one cannot start executing still because it's also waiting for C to be broadcast, as you can see, right? Okay. So this is the third slide. This is the third thing happens in cycle eight. Basically, these other instructions keep waiting because uh, their, their values are not available. Uh, no, their sources are not available. Okay, cycle nine, what happens is, assuming you had some reorder buffer, you would actually write this result, uh, but ignore that for now. Basically, uh, here, I really ignore timing as much, right? If you, we'll talk about timing very briefly, but we're not really going to do justice to the timing. Uh, uh, I'm assuming that you're broadcasting the value, capturing it, and writing it in one cycle, right? That's, that's a lot of assumption. Yes, there is a question in the back. Yeah. Uh, does every instruction in the ALU have its own uh, reservation station? <laughs> So every instruction, so this is uh, a reservation station for the adder. And yeah, for every instruction that you've decoded and renamed, you need to have a reservation station entry. Absolutely. 
So in this case, we have four reservation station entries. In this case, we have four multiplier reservation station entries. If you need more, you stall. <laughs> okay. So in this cycle, a similar thing happens. This add R8, R9, uh, this add finishes over here. So it broadcasts its tag uh, in cycle nine. And you can simulate it. You can see that, uh, I mean, we didn't animate it fully. But what happens is this instruction, this add, uh, let me see. Yeah, it was uh, adding R8 and R9. It was this instruction over here. It basically broadcasts tag C. And tag C gets broadcast everywhere, and everybody who's waiting for tag C captures the value. So this value should change to 17, and this value should also change to 17, because 8 plus 9 is 17, right? Okay, so that happens. And now in the next cycle, this instruction can start executing, right? Okay, and then cycle 10, cycle 11, I'm not gonna go through this animation, but you can convince yourself that the same thing happens. Whenever an instruction finishes, it broadcasts its tag and the value. So in this case, this is instruction, the, sec uh, the first add, which was uh, this add, it broadcasts A. So if you go back, who's waiting for A? Looks like nobody in the register file is waiting for A because R3, R5 got overwritten, if you remember, by this instruction. But there's someone who is here uh, in, the, in the reservation stations waiting for A, and that's instruction identified by tag D. So that captures value six. Now it still cannot execute because it's still waiting for the other source. So somebody's going to produce that source. And we will see who produces that source. And it will be this instruction over here, multiply. It produces the source by multiplying R7 and R10. And uh, it's, it's in, uh, wait a second, that multiplies here, Y. It broadcasts Y, and Y gets captured by R11, which is destination, and it also gets captured by uh, this reservation station entry. So I get 136 over here. And that's cycle 15. Now the, this instruction can start executing, and it's the last instruction to execute and finish. And that's how you get to cycle 19, where it broadcasts an update, uh, basically it broadcasts the value, uh, broadcast tag D, and there's only one thing that's waiting for tag D, which is the register five over here in the register file. Because we didn't decode any more instructions, there, there's nothing else uh, that's waiting for uh, that value. So it updates the register file with the value, and we're done with this program in cycle 20. Yes? In which cycle? Nine. Nine. Let me see. 19. Oh, okay, I see, I see, I see what you mean, yes. Yes, so that's a, that's a good point. Basically, we're assuming that there are multiple uh, write ports in, uh, in the register file. So that's an assumption. If there, is, if there is not enough write ports, then you basically need to serialize. There needs to be another mechanism that says, okay, you wait and broadcast in the next cycle. Exactly, yes, exactly. So these are real issues that real machines face, actually. If, if you don't have enough write ports, you, you delay the execution uh, right back a little bit. Okay, so very good questions. So I'm going to skip since we're done. But hopefully you understood the example. If not, you should go and, yes, another question. Uh -huh. Does it um, stall the dispatching? Yes, exactly. So basically, if you, if you cannot dispatch, if there is no available reservation stage, that's step one, if you remember. Uh, does it stall the dispatching for just those instructions or for all, for all instructions? So it stalls dispatching because you need to dispatch in order. Uh, not dispatch, you need to uh, allocate a reservation station entry in order because everything else uh, is dependent on it in terms of renaming. So I think, uh, I think we need to clarify the word dispatch. Uh, so uh, let's assume that you have another ad in the program and this is all full, right? You don't have space here. You need to stall the machine, right? Yes, exactly. No, no, 
because you're renaming in order. If there is another, uh, so if, 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 if that add was not there, if it was a multiply, yes. But you cannot take a, an instruction that's after the add and rename it because that will break all of the linking that we do in terms of renaming, right? So renaming is all in order, in sequential order, so that you can link the instructions. You cannot do out of order renaming. I mean, you could, but it complicates the system a lot, actually, and people don't do it. Okay, so uh, I think I already answered this question, actually. What is needed in hardware to perform tag broadcast and value capture? Basically, lots of comparators. Whenever you broadcast a tag, you compare it to every, other, every possible place any tag is stored, so you need comparators. Uh, and you also need to broadcast a value. So you need to make the value valid uh, with that compar uh, comparison result. And you need to wake up an instruction also. After, uh, so after, after you broadcast a tag, there is some machine, machinery also that I didn't really show uh, that checks whether both sources of the instruction uh, are actually ready. If both sources are ready, then in the next cycle, the instruction can start executing. But of course, multiple instructions may become ready at the same time, so you need to handle that case. If multiple instructions in the same functional unit become ready, you need to say, okay, you go first, and the next one goes first. So there needs to be machinery for that also. Okay, I already answered this question also. Does the tag have to be the ID of the reservation station entry? No, not really. We just use that for convenience over here. The tag can be any unique identifier that ensures that that particular instance of a register is named uniquely. So that anyone that needs that particular instance gets that unique name. So you could come up with your alphabet for uh, renaming. Uh, okay, what can potentially become the critical path? I think I already kind of said that also. This is actually one of the most difficult parts to design in, a, in an out of order engine. You broadcast a tag, some uh, people, uh, some, some instru instructions that are waiting for it need to capture the value based on the equivalence of the tag, and based on that, you need to determine the instruction wakes up. So this is called a loop, actually. This is called the scheduling loop uh, in an out-of-order engine. Uh, you're really trying to figure out which instructions should become ready based on what previous instruction uh, produced the value. So this could actually very easily become a critical path. And in the previous slides, I didn't really talk about timing, and I'm not, we're, not, we're not really going to a lot into timing, but timing of this uh, is not very easy uh, to handle. And people do a lot of tricks today. And how can you reduce the potential critical path? That's something for you to think about, perhaps. Okay, now let's do this exercise. So this, is, this was our example, right? If I gave you this code, you would be able to convert this to a data flow graph, right? Do you remember the data flow graph has nodes? and arcs, nodes are the operations, arcs are the values that are needed by the operations. So it's easy to take this and do a forward engineering and basically have an arc for multiply, have a node for multiply, have a node for add, and connect uh, the output of the multiply into the input of the add, right? So we can do that, that's simple. But if you look at the state of the machine in cycle seven, you could do the reverse engineering of this. What you could do is by just looking at this thing, you can really get uh, the data flow graph. Shall we do it quickly? I'd like to do at least four part of it, uh, but I don't know where my thing is. That's not, okay, let's do some white paper over here. Well, I want to be able to see this also. What happened? It has a mind of its own. Okay, maybe I don't have what I really need. Oh, okay, this is it. Cool. But I don't have the fancy picture, I guess. So you're gonna have to do without the fancy picture. So, Doki can make it, oh, there's some intelligence here. Or maybe you're the intelligence, yes. So it's not machine intelligence in the end, it's human intelligence, as you can see. <laughs> Okay, so basically, if you have this thing, we can construct the data flow graph easily. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be that easy over here, uh, but I think this is enough. Actually, we don't really need, well, we may need the register file also. Basically, by just looking at this thing, I know what's going on, right? Uh, for example, this is an add instruction. Uh, why is that zero? Okay, it's zero, fine. <laughs> 
uh, one of the inputs is four, uh, and the other input is really uh, coming from X, right? And, okay, now let me look at X just for fun. This is a multiply instruction. One of the inputs is one, and the other input is two, and it produces X. Sounds good. I'm going to connect them, right? Now we're forming the data flow graph of this thing. Uh, okay, let me switch to this one. That looks interesting. This is an add instruction, another add instruction. I don't know where to put it. I'll put it over here. Uh, both inputs are ready. One is two, one is six, right? Uh, good. And then let's take a look at this one. This is another add instruction. Uh, both inputs are ready. One is eight, one is nine. And, okay, uh, I, should, I should have done something else also. This is X. Uh, so this ad is going to produce A. This ad is going to produce B. This ad is going to produce C. Okay, now I have something interesting over here. This is a multiply instruction. And it seems like it's getting as input B and C. And it's producing Y. Sounds good. So what is left? What is left is this instruction. That's an ad instruction. That's getting input A and then Y, and then producing D. That's our data flow graph. And we can now attribute, we can uh, reverse engineer these tags to be registers, and values also to be registers. Let's take a look at how we do that. And we look at the register file for that. So D is R5, so this better be R5, I, I assume, because there's no other definition of D anywhere. B uh, is R7, where is B? So this is R7. Uh, C is R10, so this is R10. I don't know if you can see that, but this is R10. And what is this, Y? Y is R11, so that's R11. Uh, X is R3, so that's R3. A, I have no idea, because A is not here. Well, you can probably reverse engineer it, right? <laughs> so I'll let you figure the rest out. <laughs> let me actually see if I have it here so that I don't need to switch. I think it's Say it again? I think it's R5 because A was overwritten by D. Exactly. So that's how you figure that out. <laughs> so basically, the way you figure it out is uh, uh, D uh, is here, right? Uh, but how do you know that it was overwritten by D? You mean over here? Yeah, just in the previous slide. What do you mean in the previous slide? Here? Uh, no, uh, on, when you had it on the projector. I had to print it out here. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, but that's cheating, right? <laughs> 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 so basically the question is, it's clear, clearly, uh, clearly uh, somebody overwrote uh, uh, the uh, A, right? But which one? I'll let you think about that. <laughs> yes? It can be X, because X is an input. Exactly. Okay. It can't be X, that's good. Exactly, so you can eliminate, basically. You can do the process of elimination. Absolutely. Good. I'll let you think about this. <laughs> but basically, you can reconstruct the data flow graph like this. We won't, uh, I mean, I didn't do the values over here, but in the end, what you get is a data flow graph that looks like this, right? And then, we're, of course, you don't have it initially. You start with uh, this figure over here, and then essentially I reconstructed most of it, but didn't complete. For, for example, eight, nine, you can, by, based on looking at the values, you can say that, okay, this is R8, uh, this is R9, because there's no other, you need to ensure that there's no other way to produce that value somehow, but it's also clear because it's not connected somewhere else. So based on some assumptions, you can really fully reconstruct this. So this is, for example, uh, yeah. Okay, does that sound good? Do you believe that you can reconstruct the graph completely? Yes? Can you also say that it can't be Y, because Y and A, there are two inputs for the same addition. Y and A? Uh, no, you cannot say that, right? Because this instruction may actually rename the same register, which is R11. And you don't know that at this point. And I don't remember if you could actually fully reconstruct this, but I'll, I'll leave that for you as an exercise. <laughs>
because this is the fun part. <laughs> okay. Does that sound good? So basically, what we've done is just by looking at the state of the machine in cycle seven, we constructed, well, at least most of the data flow graph. But we didn't reconstruct the entire program because we don't know some of the orderings, right? You, uh, so we don't know this. This is a program that we started out with. Uh, but we don't know if, uh, by just looking at the data flow graph, we don't know how to order some of these instructions. We know that this comes before this one because there there's a flow dependence, but we don't know whether this should be ordered before this or before this. These are happening all in parallel. Actually, I'm going to switch to this data flow graph. Basically, you cannot really fully reconstruct the sequential order because the machine is really housing the data flow order. So this is really a data flow machine internally, as you can see because we constructed most of the data flow graph. It doesn't matter if we reconstructed R2 or R1. You cannot reconstruct it maybe by just looking at it because this is internally a data flow machine. It doesn't care if it's R2 or R1. What it really cares about is the name that we've assigned over here. Does that make sense? So we've successfully translated uh, the sequential program into a data flow graph internally and just by looking at the state of the machine, we cannot maybe fully reconstruct the sequential program because it's not sequential anymore internally. The way it's going to become sequential is we are going to reorder these instructions later on. Yes? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's exactly, that's why it works. <laughs> it's semantically equivalent, but it's not, you cannot reconstruct the sequential order because you're really executing things in data flow order. That's why this is a data flow machine internally. Okay, so now let's go back to this thing. And I'm faster than the human intelligence, I think. <laughs> but I'm not as good, perhaps, because it's not working. Okay, why didn't this work? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> because I picked the wrong one. Okay, so, okay, I'll let you, please do this exercise on your own. It's a very easy exercise, uh, and we have homework questions related to this also. Okay, there are a bunch of other questions over here which I'm not going to really fully answer because there are a lot of design choices that you make in an out-of-order machine. And that's actually what makes this design extremely exciting, right? When, when, do you re uh, when do you deallocate a reservation station, for example? That's a question. Do you deallocate it right after execution? That's probably a good idea because you don't really need to hold on to reservation stations after you're done with them, right? But different machines have to make different choices, actually. Should the reservation stations be dedicated to each functional unit, like what we've shown in the picture? Adder has a different uh, set of reservation stations compared to the multiplier. Or should they be global across functional units, as opposed to having four uh, reservation stations for the adder or four reservation stations for the multiplier? Should you have eight reservation stations that are shared? So what are the benefits and downsides? Basically, this is the tra trade-off between centralized reservation stations versus distributed reservation stations. Now, one trade-off is if it's centralized, it's going to be a bigger data structure, assuming you keep the same number of instructions. And now it's a, going to be bigger memory, so it may not be as easy to design. But if it's centralized, you may actually get uh, better balance. Uh, for example, if uh, in the case that you mentioned earlier, if you have a lot of uh, ads, uh, you're not limited by just four ads over here. Uh, because it's centralized, you can accommodate more ads. Whereas if you had four uh, reservation stations for four ads and four multiplies, if you just get four ads, the machine stalls after. If you, if you get five ads, the machine stalls, right? You have a problem. But if you had eight reservation station entries that you can use globally for all functional units, you could accommodate instruction mixes better. You can have five ads plus three multiplies, for example. So that's, these are classic trade-offs between centralized and distributed. If you have distributed, you, you can actually specialize the reservation station for the functional unit also. I didn't show you branch functional unit, for example, but branch doesn't, uh, uh, like multiply and add are similar in the sense that they're binary operations, but you may actually have unary operations or operations that don't need two source registers, right? Uh, so in that case, you can actually specialize uh, the reservation stations. If you have only one source register needed, your reservation station doesn't need to uh, handle two tags, right? It can handle only, it needs only one tag and one value. So it can basically specialize the reservation station to function units if you're more distributed. As you get more centralized, you need to, the, the reservation station needs to be more general purpose. Uh, 
and, as, uh, and also the, it needs to be bigger. As a result, it becomes difficult to design. So usually, current machines uh, make the trade-off such that uh, the reservation stations are usually distributed, but uh, they may not be serving only one adder. For example, you have an adder reservation station, and you may have multiple adders over there, four adders, for example, as opposed to having only one adder. Okay, another question. Should the reservation stations uh, store data values, or should there be a centralized location where all data values are stored? So this is actually another form of inefficiency. If we go back here, there are lots of values stored here. And these are, let's, if you're in a 32-bit architecture, it's 32 bits. If you're 64 bits, it's 64 bits. So you have lots of values in the register file. You have lots of values here, lots of values here, lots of values here, lots of values here. And if you keep increasing the size of this, you need to increase, add more values. So people quickly find out that these values are actually a lot of storage. Uh, and if you actually broadcast them everywhere, in the machine, that's a lot of power uh, and energy also. So maybe it's good to ask the question, should they really be stored here? Or should we have somewhere else to store them? And while well, keeping the same principles of operation. And the answer is, yes, we should have somewhere else, basically. So uh, in the worst case, for example, if, if you're always writing to a particular register, uh, you're really storing the value of that register over and over and over and over and over, right? R3, for example. Or if, you, if, you, if you're always reading, for, sorry, if you're always reading from the same register, if you're always reading, for example, R1, if all your instructions, for whatever reason, are reading from R1, all, uh, all of the sources are R1 over here, the value is the same over here, uh, the value is again the same over here, same over here, same over here. So you have a lot of duplicate values in here. So people have found out that you could actually uh, reduce the, the storage that you have uh, by not storing the values over there, but uh, storing them in a physical register file that's separate, and essentially using the ID of the register of that physical register as the tag of the instruction. Basically now, uh, uh, whenever you're renaming a register, you don't rename it uh, to the reservation station entry, but you rename it to the physical register entry. So let me, I'll, I'll quickly get to that later on. And there are trade-offs associated with it. Okay, timing, I'm, I'm going to skip this, but think about exactly when does an instruction broadcast this tag. You need to time this well so that you actually don't increase your cr critical path clock cycle time. I'll get back to this uh, physical register file with example from real engines. So there are many, many other design choices for out-of-order execution engines that I'm not going to cover. Uh, and other things like uh, exceptions actually complicate this a bit also. So let me become a little bit more realistic, and then I'll introduce the, uh, some of the concepts this way. So basically, this is an exercise with precise exceptions. How do you do this out-of-order execution with precise exceptions? The fundamentals are essentially the same. Uh, before, in this example, as some of you noticed, we're updating the register file right away. Don't do that, basically. Use a reorder buffer to reorder the instructions before committing them to the architectural state. So. Uh, the way this works is an instruction updates the register alias table when it completes execution. Uh, and this is called, the, so we're going to actually have two register files now. This is called the front-end register file. And there is a, now we're going to introduce a separate architectural register file. And an instruction updates a separate architectural register file when it retires. So this front-end register file is very similar to what we've shown. But the separate architectural register file will be updated when the, the old, uh, when the old instruction is the oldest in the machine and has complete execution. Makes sense, right? That's really your architectural state now. So basically, uh, the architectural register file is always updated in program order now. Okay, so let me actually show this very quickly again. Uh, okay, I'll use this one, and thank you. So basically, uh, no, oh, thank you even more. Okay, I'm gonna use this one. I mean, it doesn't matter which one. Oh, okay, that's a better one. So basically, before we had this uh, a register file, now this is our, uh, I'm, I'm gonna call this the front-end register file. It's at the front end of the machine. It's used for renaming. And whenever instruction finishes execution, we're gonna do exactly the same thing. But we're gonna add two other structures over here, reorder buffer and an architectural register file. 
this architecture register file will hold the architectural state. So this register file will be used for renaming. This architecture register file will be used for precise exceptions. And when an instruction finishes, it writes its value over here and also to the reorder buffer. And when instruction becomes the oldest in the machine, you take the value and update the architecture register file. So architecture register file is again R1 through R11 over here, but you update it when the instruction actually finishes in sequential order. Now the correct programmer visible state is over here. This is completely microarchitectural. It's not visible to the programmer. So you don't have imprecise exceptions anymore because this is what really matters. It's always updated in program order. Right? So that's the solution. This is very, very similar to what we've seen uh, with, uh, with the reorder buffer. And reorder buffer enables us to update this register file in program order. Okay, simple, right? But we're complicating the machine as you can see. So on an exception, what happens? Uh, oh, okay, you guys can see it, that's good. So what happens on an exception is, okay, this is better probably. Uh, you essentially, if, if you have an exception, uh, you flush the pipeline, so for example, this instruction that's the oldest in the machine had an exception. You flush the pipeline, what does that mean? You get rid of all of the instructions after this instruction, you get rid of everything in the machine, and then you basically copy the architecture register file to the physical register, uh, to, to this uh, front end register file. Because you have the correct state over here, uh, and it's precise state at this point, uh, and everything else flush, it gets flushed in the pipeline meaning that everything else becomes magically zero, invalid, and this architecture register file gets copied over here so that the system is in a precise state. Okay, so let me go over here. And that's what this sentence is about. And as a result, we have a system that looks like this. This is the out of order machine. This is the reservation stations that's used for scheduling or dispatching instructions in an out of order manner. And this is the reorder buffer. And the reorder buffer updates the architectural state in, uh, in program order. Make sense? Okay, and that's your <laughs> animal. Uh, okay, so um, most modern processors, now I'm, uh, I'm going to tell you exactly how modern processors do it. They, they use the following structures. They use reorder buffer to support in-order retirement of instructions, just like we've discussed. But they use a single register file to store all of the registers, actually. So it's not, uh, I mean, there are some processors that use what, just, uh, what I just discussed, but a lot of the modern processors, they, they use a single physical register file. There's a trade-off associated with, with, with which we're not going to go into. So this register file contains both speculative registers, meaning renamed registers, uh, and also architectural registers, architectural state. Uh, and int, integer and floating point are separate. And to be able to uh, distinguish between the front end and the architectural state, they have two different register maps. These are essentially pointers. So uh, basically there's a future front end register map that's used for renaming, and there's an architectural register map that's used for maintaining precise state. And let me, before, uh, before we do that, let me show you an example. So essentially that, uh, uh, What we have is something like this. We have a pool of physical registers, physical register file, I'm going to call it. I don't know, let's make it 0 to 255, 256 of these. And this way, we're going to eliminate all of the data values that are scattered in the system. And remember, we, have a, we had a front-end uh, register file to, do, to, do, uh, to use for renaming let's say R0 through R11, that's what we had earlier. It was actually R1 through R11. Uh, now we, we're not going to have the values over here. Remember we had the valid bits, tag, and the value. We don't want these values, we got rid of them. And whenever we rename R1, we're going to allocate a physical register for R1. There should be some uh, mechanism to allocate. So R1, for example, uh, this, is architect uh, this is not architectural, this is R1 at this point when we're renaming. R1 is renamed to, let's say, physical register 54. So tag will be physical register 54's ID. And any instruction that is going to 
be decoded at this point will get the tag physical register 54. And the instruction that's going to write to R1 will write to this physical register file. Make sense? So for example, let's, let's finish this thought and then we're going to take a break. Uh, let's assume that you have an add inst uh, multiply instruction that's writing to R1 and an add instruction uh, that's reading from R1, right? We don't care where it's writing. This multiply instruction will first allocate a physical register for R1 when it's renaming. Let's assume that it's physical register 54. So R1 will be referred to as physical register 54 from now on. And when this instruction gets decoded, it's going to see that, oh, the tag is physical register 54. So it's going to wait for physical register 54 to be broadcast as a tag. And when, when this instruction wakes up, gets selected, just, like sim just similar to what we've seen, there won't be any values in the reservation stations. The reservation stations will be just value tag. Uh, sorry, valid bit. This is valid, not to be confused with value. Valid bit tag for both sources. And one of the tags will be physical register 54 over here. Initially, when this gets renamed, it'll be zero. Uh, when this broadcasts a tag, this instruction will compare physical register 54. So it will wake up, but there is no value broadcast. The value actually, when this broadcasts the value, it broadcasts into the physical register file and it writes the value to the physical register file. So there's a value that's associated here. And when this instruction wakes up, it's going to use the ID physical register 54 for its source and get the value from the register file. Make sense? This way we actually eliminated the values, uh, the storage of the values in the, in the front end register file, all of the reservation stations by consolidating everything into this physical register file. We're connecting uh, the writer to the reader and the value is stored in just one location, physical register 54 in the physical register file. Hopefully that makes sense, you, know, you can think of it. Okay, so this is our front-end register map. Front-end register alias type table. But we also have a back-end register alias table. This is not architectural, this is renaming. Whenever you decode an instruction, you update this with renaming. Uh, but you need to also keep the architectural state. Now what does that mean? We need to have an architectural register uh, map. Again, we don't want to store values. We want to store, well, architectural registers are always valid, actually. You don't need a valid bit over there because it's your architectural state. It's better, it'd better be valid if, you have, if you're running a program. Uh, so you, what you really have is just pointers. Now, what does this mean? This may sound confusing, right? Well, this means that some of your physical registers are actually part of your architectural state. And this makes sense, right? Whenever this instruction produced physical register 54, it wrote into R1, right? This instruction finishes execution. It writes into physical register 54. That version of R1 is actually here now. Now, when this instruction becomes the oldest in the machine, this physical register 54 actually houses the correct architectural value of R1 because this instruction finished. It's the oldest in the machine, which means that R1 should point to physical 54 over here in the architectural register file, right? So you see what I did? When an instruction fin uh, becomes the oldest in the machine and it's complete execution, it basically changes the name of the architectural register to the physical register it is written to because that's the oldest in the machine. It's produced the architectural value at that point in time, assuming it doesn't have exceptions, of course. Right? So that's exactly how a current machine works. You have this front-end register file for uh, re register map for renaming. Uh, you have this architectural register map to keep the pointers to the architectural state, and this keeps pointers to the renamed state. And that this way, you don't need to store values and broadcast values all over the machine. Values are stored just here. You just need to send the values whenever you produce them into the register file, and whenever you need to read a value, you read it from this physical register file. So if you go back over here. That's what exactly this slide means. You have a future front-end register map used for renaming and architectural register map used for maintaining precise state. So I showed you this picture earlier. Uh, ignore the left part of it. The right part of it is uh, something like Intel Pentium 4. This was actually Pentium 3. I, miss, I, I said it correct, incorrectly yesterday. This was Pentium 3. So if you look at Pentium 4, it's exactly a machine like what I've shown in this now messy picture. You have this front-end 
these are the architectural registers that uh, these are the all of the registers you have. This is the front end registry alias table that points to the renamed values. And this is the architectural registry alias table. They call it the retirement registry alias table that points to the architectural registers. And sometimes they both point to the same register. Now, what does that mean? If the front end, uh, assuming one register points to the same location over here, there's no instruction in the machine that is writing to that register. That's what it means because the front end, uh, uh, registry alias table says that this register is mapped to physical register 55. The architectural registry alias table also says that this register is mapped to physical register 55. This means that there should be no instruction in the machine that produces that particular architectural register. There is no instruction in the machine that's writing to it. Okay? And this is, you also need the reorder buffer, of course. Okay, so this is a good place to uh, take a break, and then we're going to continue. So, Okay, let's continue our exploration of out-of-order engines. But I should probably refill my water first. Okay. Okay, so hopefully now you have a good idea of what a real processor is. Uh, this is actually uh, pretty much how all out-of-order execution processors operate today. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of other optimization that goes on uh, in the system, which we don't have time to get into. And if you ever get the chance to work on an out-of-order processor, take that chance, because it's the, the amount of things that you learn from that process is really amazing. Uh, I cannot even go through all of them right now. But these are the architectural high-level principles at this point. So what we've done essentially is, uh, by doing what I said, uh, is we've consolidated all of the values into this physical register file uh, such that the values are not all around the processor. They're all consolidated here. Uh, and you can, whenever you need to access a value, you basically use the physical register ID that you're waiting for, index the physical register file, and get that value. Whenever you need to update a value, you send the value to the destination physical register that you're writing to, and the, that gets updated in the register file. So that's beautiful. We are, uh, nothing stores values other than the register file at this point, at least register values. And also, this could be very, very big, actually. Of course, limited, limited by the timing uh, issues and the logic that you have. But uh, you can have a thousand entry register file over here. It could be very large. You're not bound by anything. Uh, basically, uh, if you need to rename a register many, many times, you need to create new physical registers that it gets renamed to, and having larger number of registers helps that, so that you don't need to stall, uh, stall the processor. Okay, so let's cover the concepts a little bit. This is, uh, by the way, we're gonna get a little bit more complex uh, later on when we talk about loads and stores. We haven't even touched loads and stores. That's the most messy part uh, of the system. Uh, but when we get to that, you'll see that it's going to be even more complex. But let's recap some of the uh, key concepts. Basically, how do we enable out-of-order execution? We need to link the consumer of a value to the producer, and we do this through register renaming. We associate a tag with each data value, and the tag is now the physical register ID. And then we buffer the instructions until they're ready by inserting them into the reservation stations. We keep track of the readiness of the source values of an instruction in the reservation station. We broadcast a tag when the value is produced. Instructions compare their source tags to the broadcast tag, and if matched, the source value becomes ready. And at that point, they can take the physical register ID that they're waiting for and go, to, go access the register file and get the value from there for both of their source registers. Uh, and when all source values of an instruction are ready, uh, you dispatch the instruction. Actually, I, I went ahead of, of myself. You need to wake up the instruction and select the instruction, and then it accesses the register file after that. Right. Okay, so that's basically it for out-of-order execution. So let's, let's, uh, let's think about what these enable. So register renaming eliminates false dependencies, as we said many times. It also enables linking of consumers uh, with the producers. And buffering in reservation stations enables the pipeline to move for independent instructions. Before, the problem was that we had an independent instruction that's coming later, but we have nowhere to put this dependent instruction. Now, buffering in reservation stations enable that. But we cannot just do buffering. We need to do all of this. Uh, to actually uh, enable out-of-order execution. Uh, uh, 
And tag broadcast enables communication of the readiness of the produced value between instructions. And wake up and a select enables out of order dispatch. So once you have all of these components, what you have is an algorithm for out of order execution, which is called Thomas Lowe's algorithm. And this is, as you've seen, you can uh, basically, you're, we're, we've built the data flow graph in the machine. Uh, it essentially dynamically builds a data flow graph of a piece of the program. That's why it's also called restricted data flow. It's restricted to some part of the data flow graph. Uh, which piece? Basically the piece that's in the machine, that's in all of these reservation stations. Or we'll call that as the instruction window. Basically the data flow graph is limited to what's called the instruction window. Some people call it the active window. It's all of the instructions that are decoded but not yet finished, not yet retired, not yet committed. So somebody may ask the question, can we do it for the whole program? Uh, well, then you need a lot of reservation stations, for example, to keep the data flow graph for the entire program, right? Uh, why would you like to? Because you want to execute a lot of things in parallel, right? So you actually, if, if you actually are, uh, have a lot of latency between instructions, you may, for example, if a, if a load instruction takes a thousand cycles, then if you want to keep fetching and keep executing instructions, you should have at least a thousand entries in your uh, reorder buffer, right? Because the load at some point is going to be the oldest instruction, it's going to wait for a thousand cycles. If you don't have enough entries in your instruction window, then you will not be able to decode instructions. You will need to stall the machine. That's why you would like to make it bigger. But of course, making it bigger is not easy. So making it bigger means that you need to have a large instruction window. Uh, and it's not easy to do with the algorithms that we've discussed because basically you need to have a huge physical register file. You need to have all of these tag broadcast buses, which is very difficult to eliminate. Uh, although people, have act people actually optimize that in real machines as well, but we're not going to go into how they optimize it. But it's not very efficient. So uh, scaling the size of this uh, circuitry to a very large instruction window sizes, thousands, 10,000 is not easy. So today we're around 250 or so. In the past, we were much smaller. Okay, so I think we've already said this, basically. Uh, we get a data flow graph. That's why it's uh, data flow. Okay, uh, so let's, before we go into a little bit more complexity, let's talk about why this is beneficial. Let me ask you the question. What if all operations take a single cycle? Is this useful? This may require some thinking. If all of my operations were a single cycle, Add, multiply, doesn't matter. Everything was single cycle. Would I get benefit from an out of order machine? Some people are saying no. No? Okay, and that's the right answer actually. <laughs> no, because there's no point. The instruction is going to produce the value in the next cycle, so you can actually bypass it uh, to, the, to the next instruction. Basically, this is a, uh, out of order execution is a way of dealing with long latencies. Another way of thinking about it is you basically tolerate the latency of multiple cycle operations by executing independent operations concurrently. If all of your instructions were a single cycle, there is no reason to do all of this. But real world is not uh, that simple, so everything takes a heterogeneous amount of time. So a load may take a thousand cycles, maybe more. Uh, an ad may take one cycle. So that's how you can, uh, that's why out of order machines are beneficial. So what if an instruction takes a thousand cycles? I already said this actually, how large of an instruction window do we need to continue decoding? Basically you need a thousand, a thousand entries in this case, assuming that it takes a thousand cycles after it becomes the oldest instruction in the machine, right? Yeah, basically you can tolerate as many, uh, as many cycles as you have buffering for. I have a lot of questions over here, which I'm not going to fully answer. But what limits the latency tolerance scalability of Thomas Lowe's algorithm? Basically, how, how big you can make this instruction window size. If, you're, if, if, if one of the instructions take 5,000 cycles, you need to make it 5,000 uh, instructions large so that you don't need to stall decoding. Now again, as an architect, uh, maybe you don't want to do that, right? You, you want to analyze how often do you see these instructions that take 5,000 cycles. If you don't see them that often, maybe it's okay. But if you see it 25% of the time, maybe you should increase the instruction window size so that you don't stall as much, right? Yes? Uh, why don't we use the data architecture? We'll get to that. 
Yeah, <laughs> I've already given you the answer, but we'll get to that. Basically, the, the reason is uh, you don't have precise exceptions in data flow. You cannot program it easily. You cannot make sense out of it. Whereas this internal thing is great because you can program it, you can debug it nicely, you have precise exceptions because you're still following the von Neumann model. That's the main reason, but we'll get to that again uh, soon. So basically, what, uh, what limits the latency tolerance is the instruction window size. How many decoded instructions, but not yet retired instructions, you can keep in the machine. And again, hopefully, it's intuitively clear to you that increasing the size of this is not easy. Yes? Uh, is the size of is the window size uh, a combination of the ROP size and the uh, size of... Reservation stations, yes, absolutely. It's, it's really a, a combination. But people try to minimize the size as much as possible because this consumes power. So ROB size may be larger than individual reservation station sizes. Because if you, de you ROB, uh, reorder buffer doesn't need to, uh, reorder buffer, uh, so reservation stations don't need to hold the instructions that have finished execution but not yet retired, whereas ROB needs to hold those. Okay, so that's, uh, hopefully you're doing the readings. How many of you have done this reading? Okay, more people compared to yesterday, which is good. It's an improvement. <laughs> So this is from your reading, and this is essentially what we kind of discussed, although uh, there are other things over here that you don't necessarily need to know at this point. You basically, uh, this is the decode rename dispatch logic, uh, and you send them to these buffers that are essentially the scheduling window. These are the reservation stations, and then they access the functional units, and this is the reorder and commit. And you can see that there's a single register file over here. It's not, uh, I mean, there's floating point and integer, but there's a single physical register file. So if you look at a modern design, you, you're, again, you, I don't expect you to understand everything over here, but it has pretty much a lot of the concepts that we have over here. So if you look at uh, this allocator register renamer, uh, it gets instructions from what is called the trace cache, which is a special form of instruction cache, uh, uh, and you, it renames the registers, and then it sends uh, the instructions to different reservation stations, as you can see. Memory scheduler, this is the memory part. Uh, and it has a floating point unit scheduler, simple floating point, or slow and general floating point unit, and a fast integer uh, uh, ALUs, as you can see. And you can see that this scheduler feeds two ALUs over here, and there's a slow scheduler. Uh, scheduler is really the reservation stations uh, that feed this complex one. But before you get into the reservation stations, you need to get the values from the register file or the bypass network, as you can see. So it's very similar to the machine that we built at the end. You have a single physical register file that you need to access before you actually execute the instruction. Uh, is there anything else that I need to show over here? I guess not, but this is just to give you an example. We're going to touch this unit, which is the most messy unit in this uh, soon. Okay, this is my simplified picture from my own PhD thesis, actually. I like my own picture better. <laughs> but you could, <laughs> maybe I'm a bit biased. But you can see that there's a renamer over here. That's the front end register alias table. And then you send instructions to different reservation stations, FP, int, and memory scheduler. And then you have the physical register file for floating points, physical register file for int, integer. And then you schedule instructions to the execution units. And then there's a reorder buffer over here at the end, eventually. And then there's a retirement uh, uh, register alias table. You can ignore this part. This is what I proposed in my thesis. Another machine, Alpha 21264, this is one of the fastest machines of its time. Actually, this is the fastest machine of uh, late 1990s. And you can see a very similar structure. Uh, we'll cover bench predictors later on, but into register renaming. And the, you, here you can see the cycle by cycle what happens. This is how they divided the stages. So they had a renaming stage over here. And then they had, uh, this is essentially, they called it the issue queue, but this is the reservation stations for them. And when an instruction becomes available, it accesses the integer register file, and then it goes to the integer execution units. Now, they were so tight on timing that, in this case, they duplicated the register file. They have two copies of the integer register file because they wanted to be able to send two instructions here and two instructions here. So we didn't talk about the concept of superscalar execution. We're going to see that. So far, we've executed, uh, well, maybe one instruction. But you can actually do two instructions here and two instructions here. And in order to be able to do that, assuming that two instructions, assuming that you want to uh, execute four instructions in a cycle, each of them is reading two registers, you need to have eight ports to the register file. They said this is too complex for us to design within the cycle time constraints. So we're going to design 
uh, a four-ported register file and duplicate it and ensure that they remain consistent. So that's why you have these two integer register files over here, so they can execute four integer uh, operations. So, and that's the pipeline that they had. It's a relatively shallow pipeline. So it's another machine, MIPS. Did Frank tell you what the MIPS acronym stands for? MIPS? Anybody? It's not millions of instructions per second, that's a different acronym. <laughs> MIPS initially was a design uh, that came out of the philosophy that hardware should be extremely simple. This is the philosophy of reduced instruction set computers or simple computers. They basically said, we're going to make hardware extremely simple. All of the code scheduling will be handled by the compiler. So we're not going to have any hardware support for dependency checking or interlocking. So MIPS means microprocessor without interlocking pipeline stages. So that was their vision in 1980s, early 1980s. They wanted to have very simple hardware. And the compiler schedules the instructions, it handles the scheduling of the instructions so that you don't have dependency issues in the pipeline. And initial MIPS designs were like that. They quickly figured it out that it's very low performance. So this is a, one of the latest MIPS designs. You can see that it's very heavily out of order execution. So forget about interlocking. They added a lot of hardware. <laughs> to make it high performance. Because it was not easy to have simple hardware and get high performance out of it. Because you just cannot deal with these long latencies easily in the compiler and variable latencies in the, easily in the compiler. That's why uh, the vision that said there should be very little hardware, there should not be even support for interlocking. In fact, the initial MIPS said we don't even want floating point units. If you want floating point, do integer operations to get your floating point. Oh, no, <laughs> it doesn't work. If you want performance, you really need this complexity over here in hardware. So as you can see, this is very similar uh, to what we've discussed. You have a register map table, front end, uh, and you have, the, uh, uh, you have the schedulers over here, and you have the register file over here, and then you have the functional units over here. And they don't show the uh, other stuff over here, but that's fine. Uh, but there, there's another interesting thing that show here. Basically, they have these free register lists. Basically, uh, this shows that they, you need to allocate free registers because there's a physical register file. You need to decide when a physical register becomes free and when it's not available. And I'll let you think about that. I think one of your colleagues thought about that already. This is IBM Power 4. It's also relatively old, but it's very similar again. Uh, and again, I'm not going to go through this in detail. So IBM Power 4, it was, it was one of the first multi-core machines, actually. Uh, but each core uh, had out of order execution at a 100, 100 entry instruction window. And it was an eight white superscalar machine. It was able to uh, fetch and decode and execute eight instructions per cycle. We're going to get to superscalar execution later. And it had a hybrid branch predictor, which we're going to cover later on. Okay, this is IBM Power 5. What they did was it's essentially the same machine, but they added multi threading on top of it. We were able to execute two threads. And this is a general purpose processor. These power systems are used heavily in financial, uh, in the financial world. And actually, it's not just one processor. It's really a collection of many processors. So if you want to buy one of these, you need to pay IBM one to five million dollars or so probably. So you cannot just buy it uh, as a single machine. So if you have deep pockets, you can have one of these. But it's very similar again. Uh, uh, I mean, you, you see that uh, there's, well, it's not very nicely shown over here, but these are the issue queues. Again, it's, uh, it's the schedulers, and then they select, and then they access the register file over here, and after they get, they get the source operands from the register file, they, get, uh, they execute over here. Uh, these are the execution units. And then this is kind of like a pipeline diagram, and then you write the register file at the end, and then group completion is their name for the reorder buffer, basically. Have, have, have you completed the instruction at this point? Okay. Okay, now I can go on and on uh, and show ARM Cortex-15 or whatever, uh, but we're not going to do that. Basically, all of the machines uh, that are out there today, in this, for example, I have an out-of-order machine that's running efficiently and at high performance. Okay, now you know the basic principles of it. Now let's talk about the most hairy part of an out-of-order engine, which is handling of loads and stores. Now this is going to be, uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but it's really important to understand that memory is the really most hairy part. 
so let's talk, we've talked about registers. Actually, handling registers added a lot of complexity to the system, right? But it's actually the easy part. <laughs> so we considered mainly registers as part of the state. What about memory? There's a fundament, there are multiple fundamental differences between memory and registers. The first one is really interesting because it's going to cause a lot of complexity and headache in the design. Register dependencies are known statically, meaning you look at an instruction, it sources register three, you know the sources, you know the destination. Good, you can do renaming easily, right? Because you know everything at the front end of the machine after you decode the instruction. But memory, you need to execute the instruction a little bit to get the address. So you don't know the memory address of an instruction at the beginning of the pipeline in the decode stage. And this is the cause of all of the headaches that we're going to have. On top of this, these addresses are not small, they're large. So register state is very small. We looked at 32 registers, 64 registers. Memory state is huge. The addresses are very large, right? So this is going to cause, this is going to double our headache a little bit. Uh, and the register state, this is um, also interesting, but we're not going to tackle it as much. If you look at other threads or processors, uh, they don't share the registers normally. Whenever you write a multi-threaded program, for example, different threads don't share registers. So you don't need to worry about them. But memory state in a shared memory multiprocessor, which is most of what multiprocessors are today, is shared between different threads and processors. And this could cause headaches if you update memory state in an out-of-order manner. But we don't want to update memory state out of order anyway. But we're not going to tackle this one. But this is another difference between registers and memory. So the first two problems are going to cause us headaches with out-of-order execution. The last one we can perhaps handle. There are some issues over there, but you really need to take the advanced architecture class to understand them. And those are also hairy issues, by the way. OK, so, let's, uh, so what, what are the issues that are caused? Basically, if you have an out-of-order machine, you're executing instructions out of order. You need to obey these memory dependencies also. It's not just about registers. You need to, you need to have, ensure that memory dependencies are correctly obeyed meaning that a load may be dependent on a store, and you need to ensure that load gets the correct value from the correct store. Now, we handle this nicely with a register renaming, but these are not registers. These are memory addresses, right? Registry addresses we know at the beginning of the pipeline, so we can rename nicely to other namespace. Memory addresses we don't know until we execute the instruction. OK, and we need to do so while providing high performance. So that's the problem, basically. The, the key observation and key problem is that the memory address is not known until a load or a store instruction executes. So first corollary is renaming memory addresses is difficult because of this. You cannot do it at decode stage. If you really want to do renaming, you need to do it over here. But that's too late because things are already out of order over there. The beauty of renaming was when you're doing the renaming, it's in order. So it can link the producer to the consumer correctly. Here, it's a mess. OK. Because one instruction may have generated uh, an address in some way, another instruction may have generated an address in another way. So let me switch to this very quickly. I think we're going to switch back and forth a bit. So let's assume that we have a program. You have a store instruction here. It basically uh, computes an address based on R5 and with some offset. And then uh, it writes, I don't know, R10 over here. And then we have a load instruction that computes its address based on R, I don't know, 25. And then writes the result into far whatever register. It's not important. That's also not important. So the key question is, this, uh, when this executes, it generates an address, A. When this executes, it generates an address, B. Is this address, A, dependent on B? Well, if you knew addresses A and B, that's great. <laughs> you could compare them. But what if this executes earlier? Because you're doing out-of-order execution, this store may be dependent on something that takes 1,000 cycles. But this load may be dependent on something that takes two cycles. So this load is ready to go. It generates its address. It generated A. The store is up there still waiting for uh, R5, for example, or even the source register. Maybe both of its source registers it's waiting for. So you have no idea what the address of the store is, and you want to execute this load. There's a problem, right? Because if, if the addresses are going to be the same, you want to get the value from the store. 
So what do you do? And that's the key problem. Uh, so we're going to take a look at that a little bit. Okay. So essentially, determining the second corollary, what I showed you is determining the dependence or independence of loads and stores has to be handled after their partial execution. I say partial execution because uh, load kind of has two, uh, it generates its address and then it uh, loads the value in that address to uh, a register. But address generation is just partial execution of it, the load. The next step is going to the memory and getting that location. But if you don't know if a store is writing to that address, then maybe you should wait. Okay? And there's also another corollary three, which makes, uh, which is also what I discussed actually. When a load, let's assume we are talking about loads right now. When a load has its address ready, there may be older stores with unknown addresses in the machine. And the other way around also works. When a store has its address ready, there may be younger loads with some unknown addresses in the machine. The first one is more, more serious, of course. So let's take a look at this. Uh, basically, this is essentially the example that I showed you. When this load has its address ready, it doesn't know if the store is writing. What may be worse is there may be another store whose address is also not ready. And this load may be reading, let's say, I don't know, four bytes over here. And one byte may come from here, and one byte may come from here. So it's actually much more messy than you may actually initially think. There may be actually many stores writing to these locations. So you need to actually get the value correctly uh, to be able to do that. Okay. So to, to basically get the correct result, right? Okay, so we're not going to solve the entire problem. I'm going to give you the complexity of the problem and some approaches to handle it. But believe me that this is the messiest part of an out-of-order execution engine, and this is the least scalable part of an out-of-order execution engine. Uh, if you thought that it was really the tag broadcast logic, you're wrong. It's really this logic that uh, disables the scalability. Okay, so the key question is, when do you schedule a load instruction in an out-of-order execution engine? As I said, the problem is a younger load can have its address ready, before an older store's address is known. This is also known as the memory disambiguation problem. You disambiguate addresses or the unknown address problem. I like the unknown address problem because it's simple thinking. Unknown address. So there are multiple approaches to this. One is a conservative approach, which is terrible for performance in general. You stall the load until all previous stores have completed, uh, computed their addresses. You can do that, right? In this example that I've shown you, I'm not going to switch to it, but there are a bunch of stores in front of, uh, older than this load. You basically wait until all of them compute their addresses. It doesn't matter if it takes 1,000 cycles, 5,000 cycles, you just wait. And when all of them have computed their addresses, now you know which store you're dependent on. You need to do something to know that, of course, but you know. Or, I mean, if, if you're even more conservative, you just wait until all of the stores are out of the machine, meaning all of them have retired and updated the memory. But that even takes longer, as you can imagine. So this is the conservative approach, and this is terrible for performance. Aggressive approach takes exactly the opposite. It basically says, I'm a load, I know my address, I'm going to assume that I'm independent of any other previous stores. I'm going to schedule this load right away. Okay? That's aggressive. Basically, the prediction is that hopefully this load is not going to depend on any of the stores. Of course, if you do this, you need to check later on. Did I actually predict this correctly? This is a method of, uh, this, is a, uh, this is an example of predicting something in a machine. So this actually also doesn't work extremely well, although it's usually better than the conservative approach. Uh, but it adds additional machinery uh, to check, basically. If you're wrong, you should re-execute this load and get the correct value. So if you're wrong, you flush the pipeline, basically. Okay, there's also an intelligent approach which pretty much all existing machines employ, which is essentially more intelligent, as I said. You predict with a more sophisticated predictor if the load is dependent on any unknown address store. Okay. So let's take a look at this a little bit more. Uh, as I said, a load dependent status is not known until all previous store addresses are available. Uh, there are two questions, actually. One is, how do you detect the dependence of a load instruction on a previous store? You wait, you wait until all previous stores are committed. In this case, there is no need to check for address match. The logic is simple. Or the second option is you keep a list of pending stores in a store buffer. This is also called a store queue. 
and check whether a load address matches a previous store's address. Uh, so basically, uh, I, okay, I'll, I'll get back to this later on. Uh, and, the, uh, and the next question is, how do you treat the scheduling of a load instruction with respect to previous stores? You assume all load, load is in, dependent on all previous stores. You assume load is independent of previous stores, or you predict the dependence. Of course, if you want to predict the dependence, somehow you need additional logic for that. So let's take a look at this one. Uh, first, if you assume a load is dependent on all previous stores, this is good because you don't need to add any logic. You just wait until all previous stores are done. But it's too conservative because it delays independent loads unnecessarily, right? Again, in this example, uh, these stores take a thousand cycles, this load is ready, and if it's independent, you basically delay this load for a thousand cycles. If you do option two, uh, assume the load is independent of every previous store, it could actually be simple, and it's a common case, there's no delay for independent loads, but we have to pay the tax for recovery. If you're wrong, first of all, you need to figure out that you're wrong, so you, there needs to be some additional logic that says you, you sent this load, you executed it, but you were wrong. So there needs to be some checking that needs to happen. When the store computes its address, it needs to check, okay, whether if, if there was a load that actually uh, assumed that it was independent of the store. So that's a mess. Uh, so basically, it requires recovery and re-execution of the load. So existing machines actually flush the pipeline uh, whenever they're wrong. The option three is the intelligent option. You basically predict the dependence of a load on an outstanding store. I'm not telling you how to actually do that. There are mechanisms for this. Actually, this, this, is, uh, this was the subject of a very uh, prominent uh, legal battle between one university, whom I will not name, uh, and a bunch of companies uh, that the university claimed that they actually patented this work, and the companies use some sort of memory disambiguation, and there was a huge legal battle that lasted for a really long time. Uh, you can probably figure that out. <laughs> okay, but this is more accurate, uh, clearly. Uh, because load store dependencies actually persist over time, people found out that if this store is writing to a location that this load is going to read, whenever you go back to the same load and store in a loop, for example, it's going to happen again and again and again, so you can learn from past executions. But of course, if you're wrong, you still need to recover and re-execute. And there are some in very interesting papers. For, for example, the alpha 21 to 64, if you read this optional reading, you will see that whenever it executes a load, initially it assumes that the load is independent. It figures out if it's right or wrong. If it's wrong, the next time it says, I'm not gonna assume that it's independent, I'm gonna assume it's dependent. So it basically learns over time a little bit. Okay. So this is very quickly, uh, this is showing the conservative approach, no speculation, uh, aggressive approach, and the perfect approach. And this is performance on the y-axis, instructions per cycle. And these are some workloads that people have used in 1990s, as you can see. Some of them are interesting, like Go benchmark, this is, it plays Go. Uh, GCC is a compiler, uh, compression. So these are actually still used, some of them. Uh, but basically, if you look at this, Conservative approach is actually terrible. Aggressive approach is a little bit better, but perfect approach has a huge gap. So that's why you would like to handle this well. So simple predictors actually can achieve actually most of the potential performance. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about how to do the prediction. You can leave that to your imagination. But let's talk about data forwarding between loads and stores also. So we cannot update memory out of program order, clearly. Uh, that we cannot even update registers because that would violate sequential semantics. Which means that you need to buffer all store and load instruction and instruction window, and we know that. We could use the reorder buffer for that. Now I'm gonna sidestep the problem. I'm gonna say, even if we know all of the addresses of past stores, this is still complex. So when we generate the address of a load, two questions still remain. One is how do we check whether or not it's dependent on a store? So there needs to be some way, assuming that you would like to schedule this load uh, at that point in time, you don't want to be, take the conservative approach. And how do we forward the data to the load if it's dependent on a store? So for this, you need a special structure. And these special structures are usually decoupled uh, into load queue and store queue for this. It can be combined between load stores. For example, Pentium Pro in Intel had, it's, it was called a memory ordering buffer, mob. Uh, so you had a mob in a, a processor. Uh, but you can combine uh, and separate, uh, basically, you have a load queue and a store queue. 
So whenever you want to, uh, you produce the address of a load, what you do is you search the store queue to check if there is any store that you're dependent on so that you can schedule the load. And a store, when it finishes execution, search, when it computes its address, uh, it searches the load queue to see if there is a load that's dependent on it. This is, the, the second one is needed if you're doing uh, prediction, if you're, uh, to, so that you can check your prediction, right? If you predicted this load is independent uh, and you've executed it, but then the store address became available, and then the store needs to check if any of the loads got the wrong value because they were predicted to be independent of the store. So I'm not going to talk about the second case, but it's also needed if you're doing intelligent prediction. But the first case is needed even if you're not doing prediction. You just want to be able to decide whether this load is dependent on a store, and even assuming that you know the addresses of all of the previous stores. Okay. Uh, so when a store instruction finishes execution, it writes us the address and data in its reorder buffer entry or the store queue entry. When a later load instruction generates its address, it basically searches the store queue with its address. So we're going to look at how bad that search is. And it accesses memory with its address. Uh, and it receives a value from the youngest older uh, instruction that wrote to that address, hopefully. So to be able to do this, uh, you need a complicated search logic. And this is actually, the, remember the content addressable memory that I introduced in the previous lecture? This is the worst content addressable memory that you have to enable out of order execution of loads and stores. So content is really memory address, but you also need other stuff, like the size, like the age also. So let's take a look at this. This is called the store to load forwarding logic. So basically, I'm gonna make it simple, this is a store queue. This is an in-order list of all of the stores that are in the machine. You have a head, it's all hardware, of course. You have a tail. And what do you have over here? Clearly, you need to have a valid bit, whether this is valid, and then address of the store, which could be 64 bits, and then a data value of the store if it's available, which could be 64 bits. And the valid is one bit. Uh, and of course, you need to also have valid bits to see whether the address of the store is valid and whether the data of the store is valid also, which makes it really interesting and complicated because the store executes. Uh, if the store hasn't computed its address yet, its address is not valid. But the data may be available, right? You're in an out of order engine. Uh, the data may uh, already be ready. Okay, so whenever a load instruction, so let's assume that you have a store here uh, at address A, Let's assume that addresses are all known. I'm going to make it even simpler. Now let's assume that you have another store here. Okay, A, B, C, D, all stores are here, X. And we have a load over here that computes its address. And let's assume that, I don't want to call it, uh, let's assume that it, it computes an address Z. The key question is, can this, where should the data, this load get its value from? So what it needs to do is it needs to compare the Z to all of the addresses over here. So basically, for each entry, you need to have a comparator, right? That sounds terrible already. It's going to become more terrible. And this is a 64-bit comparator, assuming your address is 64 bits. I mean, I exaggerate a bit because normal machines don't use the entire 64-bit address space. Let's assume that it's 48 bits, okay. That's more realistic. So it's a 48-bit comparator of address. And you do this. But th is that enough? That's not enough, right? I've given you an example earlier where one store is writing to uh, one byte over here, another store is writing to another byte, and this load is reading these two bytes. So you may actually match in multiple places. That's the first observation. It's not a single match. You really need to match in the multiple, uh, uh, all the latest locations that you're trying to read. So it's, it's really, uh, there could be multiple locations, and also you'll need to get the multiple, uh, the latest stores that write to that location. And also, what makes it a little bit more complicated is uh, you, you need to ensure that the size also matches. So uh, let me actually go, uh, go back over here. I'm not going to build the complete logic over here, clearly. Uh, if you get a chance to build it, build it for sure. 
But basically, this is the complexity of the search. It's a content addressable search based on the load address, as I showed you. It's a range search, meaning based on the address and size of both the load and the earlier stores, because you may partially overlap with the address, right? This load may be accessing bytes uh, 8 through 12. The store may be writing bytes 11 through 12, right? It's an age-based search. You want to get the last written values. And that's essentially what you need to build over here. Now, on top of this, uh, load data can... Let me go back, actually, over here to the DocuCam. So you need to find the latest stores. Uh, so if, assuming that, let's, let's say you're loading addresses uh, Z, Z plus 1, uh, Z plus 2, and Z plus 3. Oh, you cannot see it? Okay, sorry. So basically, you want to access addresses Z, Z plus 1, because it's a 4-byte load. You need to be able to ensure that you find all of the stores that are writing to all of the latest uh, riders to each of these locations. Now, you may be able to find one that's writing here, another that's writing here, another that's writing here. OK, three stores are writing here. What, where do you get the fourth one from? Well, now you need to access memory for that. Because there's no load uh, store that's writing to that one. So it's actually to be able to get your data value you need to search this, and you also need to access memory. That's why this is one of the most complicated parts. And when you search this, of course, there may be no match. Then you access memory, of course, to get all of it, right? Because you, there may not be any stores that are writing to the location that you're reading. At that point, you need to access memory. So this search may be useless. But you need to do it to ensure that you get the correct value for the load. Make sense? Yes? Exactly, exactly, exactly. You could use it uh, to check, of course, but uh, if, if you have a match, you need to get the value from somewhere. Yeah. So it, it serves two functions, basically. It serves the function of, can you schedule this load? And if the load is actually dependent uh, on a store, give the value for data forwarding. Okay, I already said this, basically. This is the last uh, example that I gave. Any questions? Is this clear? The complexity? I'm not going to ask you questions on the load store forwarding logic. It's, but you should really know that this is really the tough part. People try to scale the size of the instruction window. Yeah, they can scale the reservation stations, but it's very tough to scale this logic much harder, uh, much larger. I believe existing processors maybe have a 24 entry store buffer even though the instruction window size may be 256 or so. So it's very small compared to other parts of the machine. And you're usually limited by how many stores you can put into the machine because of that reason. So if you keep putting a lot of stores into your machine, you're probably uh, destroying the performance of your machine. So try not to store, uh, try not to store much in your machines. <laughs> and the reason is because of this, basically. This is very hard to scale, and you cannot, the machine cannot have a lot of stores in it. OK, if there are no questions, this is a good place to stop. Next time, we'll start with other approaches to instructional level parallelism. And have a good weekend. <laughs>